Thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with us. Our hope is that every message here at Life Church allows you to get to know the real Jesus even more than you did before. We hope you'll be able to join us at one of our many campuses or online every single week. Just jump on livelife.church to find the campus nearest you. If this message has impacted you, we encourage you to click on the Give tab and partner with us through giving and seeing what God can do through Life Church. Come on, let's sing this together. If you know it, let's sing it out. Said the night went to the little lamb. Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb. Do you see what I see? A star, a star. Dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. With a tail as big as a kite. I said the little lamb to the shepherd boy. Do you hear what I Ringing through the sky, shepherd boy. Do you hear what I hear? Oh, a song, a song. High above the trees with a voice as big as the sea. With a voice as big as the sea. They said the shepherd boy to the mighty king, do you know what I know? In your palace warm, mighty king, do you know what I know? Oh, a child, a child. Shivers in the cold, let us bring him silver and gold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Said the king to the people everywhere, listen to what I say. Listen to what I say, oh, the child, the child, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light, he will bring us goodness and light.
Hello, hello. Good to see you. Glad you're with us. We want to welcome all of our Life Church campuses. And so, Sparta, we're glad you're with us. Livingston, Cookville South, we're excited what God's going to do in your lives today. And so, all of our campuses, Cookville North as well, we want to welcome everyone online, all those at the military bases, and all those in the correctional facilities. We welcome you to church. Amen. Amen. Well, how many's ready for Christmas? Been asking you that the last couple weeks. So if you're like me, I delegate a lot of what happens at Christmas to my wife. I'm responsible for one gift. The rest of them are up to hers. And here's why. She's a better shopper. And all the men said, yes, you did. (laughs) Yes, you did. Anyway, let's pray. We'll get into it. Father, thank you so much that we can come once again and learn from you, Jesus. You're the teacher. Holy Spirit, you're the one who reveals all truth. So we ask you to open our eyes that we can see clearly what you want us to see. Give us ears to hear what you want us to hear and hearts to receive it and believe it. And we thank you for it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're in our third week of Christmas playlist. Pastor Jason's done a phenomenal job the last two weeks. And what we're doing is we're talking about and discussing our favorite Christmas songs from the past. And the songs we're covering is about the prophecy, the purpose, the proclamation, and the promise of Christmas. And so this week, we're going to cover the proclamation. The world was in the middle of the Second World War. And France had found themselves overwhelmed by Hitler's German army. French-born man named Noel Regni was unwillingly drafted into the German army. Matter of fact, while he was serving in the German army, Noel joined the French underground movement. He hated having to serve in Hitler's army. After he was wounded one day but one day but trying to help the French overthrow and defeat the Germans, he finally decided that he was going to desert the German army, went into hiding, and he stayed underground for the rest of the war. Noel always had a love and a passion for music ever since he was a small child. And so after the war, after World War II was over, he became a music director in France. In 1952, Noel moved to New York City where he began writing and composing music. Matter of fact, he was behind a lot of the theme songs for early television programs and very popular commercial jingles. The year became 1962, and America was facing possibly, and the world was facing possibly World War III, the worst war that had ever happened. Some of you may remember it. It was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Anybody remember the Cuban Missile Crisis? What was that? In short, the United States and the Soviet Union were on the verge of nuclear war. It was a very scary time for our nation The world was really, for the first time, possibly experiencing total annihilation. Fear was everywhere. Some of my older siblings told me about in school where they'd have the drills. I was born in the 60s, 67. But they talked about the drills. Many bomb shelters were being built by Americans. You that are old enough remember the fear that took place. During that same time, a music producer had come to Noel and asked him to write a Christmas song. And really, Noel said that was the last thing on his mind was to write a Christmas song in the midst of all that was going on. But one day he was walking home from his office and it was in the back of his mind, they want me to write a Christmas song with everything that's going on. And he said, as I looked and saw the people walking down the streets, usually that time of year, you see a lot of joy and laughter. And it's just an exciting time. But he said, this Christmas season, there was nothing but fear on the faces of the people. Fear and dread and despair. And he said, I'm trying to work this all through my mind. And all of a sudden, he saw two young mothers 
pushing their strollers with small children. And all of a sudden, he locked eyes on these kids, and their faces were different. All the other faces were full of fear and anxiety and despair, but these two small children were smiling, and there was a peace upon them. And he thought, wow, what a difference. And Noel went home after seeing that with those small children and wrote this song in 1962, Do You Hear What I Hear? What I want to talk to you about, Jesus Christ made a statement. He said, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to get, on, get in on what I'm doing on earth, you must, not should, you must become as a small child. What was he saying? Requires total trust. Total trust. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us don't live in that on a daily basis. Listen, God, Christmas is God's proclamation that his children can live in perfect peace in a stress-filled world. Think about this a minute. You look at small children. They don't live in the constant state of stress that we adults do. And there's a reason behind that. Well, they have stressful times and days, but you know what I'm saying. The fear and anxiety that we live in. They say that stress is the number one killer in America. Medical doctors who've done studies on this are saying behind nearly every disease, heart disease, cancer, all, the root of it is fear and anxiety. Why? Because we weren't created to live in that. It's killing us. The psychologist did a study and said that as they studied small children, they did a study. And do you know how many times a small child, on average, laughs a day? 300 times. On average, 300 times. When they did the study on adults, four times a day. Four times a day. That's the average. Something's happened. I believe that's why Jesus said, you're going to have to come and trust me as a small child. Think about this a minute. Kids experience times of fear and, and, and anxiety. And, you know, they go through hard things in their little lives. But you know, what a, you know what a child does when it senses that fear, that anxiety? We need to learn from this. They run to their parent. That place of security. Do you understand that's what God's telling us to do? You don't run to me. You're running around everywhere trying to figure it out. Run to me. Notice this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Notice what he says here. Don't worry about anything. Stop. Has anybody got that one 100% worked out yet? If you do, I want you to lay hands on me after the service and transfer that. But he, put, listen, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have put it in the book if he didn't mean it. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about that child that acts crazy that you've prayed for and raised them in church and are acting. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about your finances, although you got laid off. Don't worry about your marriage, though your spouse is acting like they don't want to be in it anymore. Don't worry about anything. Wow. But he doesn't stop there. If he stopped there, we're all in trouble. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You know what he's saying? Run to daddy. Listen to me. You only got two choices in life. You can worry about everything and be praying about nothing. Or you can stop worrying about anything and pray about everything. But you're doing one or two. Like, let me tell you right now. If you're not a prayer, I guarantee you, you're a warrior. And if you're a warrior, I guarantee you, you're not a prayer. Because he said right here. Those that don't worry about anything are those that pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank you for all he's done. Then, everybody say then. So, so here it is. You want peace? Do you, do you really want peace? Here it is. If you want peace, if I want peace, I got to stop worrying about everything and start praying about everything. And when I do that, then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask a question. Do you hear what I hear? Because when I read this, I hear the Holy Spirit saying, if you'll start running to the Father 
And quit trying to worry about everything. If you'll run to the Father, you'll experience a peace that passes understanding. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. In our difficult seasons of uncertainty, and we all have them, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, can still speak peace to our souls. But we've got to run to him. I, I, I fall short in this. To, to be totally transparent with you, if I'm not careful as this church grows, my stress and anxiety can grow. Why? A lot of people counting on you. Counting on your leadership. We are very likely within the next year, year and a half, approaching over 5,000 people that call Life Church home. Now listen, that excites me, not just because it's a big number. That's 5,000 people hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That fires me up. But here's the thing. Amen. Amen. But here's the thing. What happens is I get in this constant, wow, I'm leading all them people. I'm bang them. You know what I'm saying? And so I can let that stress me out, leading and feeding nearly 5,000 people. But you know what? Jesus spoke to me recently. (laughs) He just put things in perspective for me. He said, wow, 5,000 people. Bobby, I did three times that on one afternoon with a Lunchable. What's your problem? (laughs) What's your problem? But here's the deal. Do you know what I feel like the Lord was showing me? If I want his peace to increase in my life, I've got to discern the difference between my responsibility and his ability. Huge. It'll set you free if you get a hold of that. See, I've got some responsibilities, but it's his ability that carries it, carries it through. If I want his peace to increase in my life, I've got to discern the difference between my responsibility and his ability. See, what am I responsible for? Study the word of God. Stay loyal. Don't compromise what God said in his word when I preach. Lead this staff and this church with integrity. Love my family. Be loyal to my wife and kids. Those are my responsibilities. But what God does in the future of this church, that's his ability. And if I'll discern between the two, I'll sleep a lot better. You know what I'm talking about? See, see, here's what I know about me, and I think it's true about you. Problems don't stress me out. Problems don't stress, stress me out. What I, here, here's what I mean. If I go outside after this service and there's a flat tire on my truck, that's a problem. That's an inconvenience. But I can fix it. Or one of the ushers can. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. But that, listen, that's an inconvenience, a problem, but it don't stress me out. You know what stresses me out? Is families who get mad at the church. See, I can't fix that. You know what stresses you out? That wayward child that you're scared something bad's going to happen to them. That'll keep you up. That'll steal your appetite. And so what we got to do is learn the difference. Remember, Jesus said, come to me as a child. Learn the difference between our responsibility and his ability. He can take care of the things that we can't take care of. Um, Paul himself, if you go study the life of Paul, and Paul the apostle next to Jesus... He's my hero in the New Testament. Jesus, number one. But Paul's my hero. Just the way he lived his life for Christ, or Christ lived through him. Paul, the Holy Spirit used him to write three quarters of the New Testament. And you know, Paul had to learn to discern the truth that I'm talking to you about right now. The difference between his responsibility and God's ability. When you read about the life of Paul, he one time says, he's talking to people about the things he's gone through. And he says, I've been beaten with rods three times. Now, what you don't understand is that beating, if you understand the Roman beating back then, they beat you nearly to death, and right before you died, they quit beating you. He said, I've gone through that three times. I've been shipwrecked. I've been thrown in prison after prison. I've been hungry. I've been naked. I've been wounded. But you know what he says about that? This is a translation now. He said, those things, I could handle them. Wasn't that big a deal. He said, the thing that really gets me, the thing that upsets my stomach is the care of the churches. Stress will kill you. See, sometimes we read about these guys in the Old Testament and the the New Testament, and we think that they were superhuman or they had an access to God we don't have. No, no, no. The Bible says they were ordinary just like you and I. They had to learn the same things me and you have to learn. And so Paul said, I've had to learn 
how to replace peace for stress. Matter of fact, it's the very reason he wrote to Pastor Timothy. If you go read the book of Timothy, you'll understand why Paul wrote to Timothy. Here's why he wrote to him. Timothy was depressed and stressed. Go read it. Paul wrote to him. In that, he even talks to him about his stomach issues. What was it? The stress was killing his stomach. And so Paul is writing to Timothy. Let me tell you why Timothy was stressed. He pastored in the region of Ephesus. And his church had gone multi-site. They were approaching 20,000 people. That will stress you out. And Paul writes to him to tell him how to deal with this stress. See, here's the truth, folks. Some things are just too big for us. Listen, they're just too big. We can't fix them. So we must learn to run to God who's bigger than those things. Sunday evening. Sunday evening, I'm sitting at my house. It's between 8 and 8.30 at night. My phone rings, and it's a number I don't recognize. And a lot of times I don't answer those. But I answered it, and there's a lady's voice on there, and she seems very um, distraught. And I'm, just to be honest with you, she said, is this Pastor Bobby? And I wanted to lie and say, nope. (laughs) Bell house the wrong number. Because you don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, but of course, I said, yes, this is Bobby Davis. And she said, Pastor Davis, I'm calling you on behalf of a family who wanted me to contact you and ask you if you would hold the funeral of their 10-year-old son. That's bigger than me, okay? That's bigger than this old boy up here. And in my flesh, I want to say, no, get another preacher. I mean, that, there's no words. And so, and many of you heard about that. It was a tragic situation. See, that young boy came to this church when he could. Loved our faith factory. They said when he couldn't come to church, he watched online. So here's the deal. I said, yes, you you tell that family we're there. Whatever they need, you tell them to call on us. We want to be there for them. When I hung up, I immediately prayed for the peace of God to be upon them. Because that's too big for me. But then I started thinking about myself. God, I don't know what to do here. I need help. I, I don't care how many years you've done this and how many funerals you've been. That's just, anybody want to talk about? Can't get your mind around that. And you know what God didn't speak to me? He didn't say, you got this. You know what he, you know what he spoke to me? I got this. I got this. And so, we had the f- funeral up at the edge, and um, I went in, and I just sensed God with me. Um, hugged the grandmother, hugged the father, hugged the mother, the friends and the niece, uh, the nephews. I mean, the uncles and aunts and all those that were there. People grieved. Listen, we all grieved. But I sensed God with me, and when I took the platform, I sensed him with me. Listen, we need that. There's some things bigger than us. You can't, you can't get it in college. See, here's the truth. People will say this. You may have said this. Well, I can't wait to get to heaven just to enjoy a little peace. You know what I'm talking about? Don't. Don't wait to get to heaven to enjoy peace. uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 11 says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Here's the purpose of Christmas, ladies and gentlemen. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And in heaven, no, no, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus Christ did not come to earth and suffer and die so you and I could access peace in heaven someday. He came to bring heaven to earth. He came so we could have peace right now on the earth. And if you're not living in that, you're cheating yourself of the huge benefit of your salvation. The word peace, here's what it means. Inner tranquility. 
Inner tranquility. The word tranquil means very calm. Hear to me. Free from disturbance. Does that sound like you're alive? Now, you may say, I got five kids at the house. Are you kidding me? I didn't ask you about your house. I'm asking you on the inside. Is there an inner tranquility? Is there a peace that passes understanding? Because that's what Jesus came to bring. Listen to this. Mark 4, 35. And a great windstorm arose. That happens in our lives, doesn't it? All of a sudden, something hits our marriage that we wasn't expecting. A doctor's report comes that we wasn't expecting. Something hits us financially that we weren't expecting. A windstorm can arise. Notice this. And the waves beat into the boat, so it was already feeling. You ever felt like you were sinking? That's where they were at. See, water belongs on the outside of the boat, not the inside. So here they are, this windstorm. Water starts crashing into the boat. Notice the next verse. 38, but he, Jesus, was in the stern asleep on a pillow. <clears throat> this is before the my pillow guy, okay? I get it. I mean, that, that new my pillow, I mean, it makes your body quit hurting, you sleep better. It's like you've had anesthesia or something because of my pillow. Jesus didn't have a my pillow. But he's sleeping through a great Windstorm. Notice this. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Get up and freak out with us. What are you doing laying there sleeping? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. See, here, if we'll learn how to get this inner peace, we can start speaking out or outward peace. But the, but the inner peace comes first. See, Jesus' peace is different from the world's peace. It's not based on outward conditions. See, in this story, the waves were roaring, he's snoring. <laughs> They're screaming, he's dreaming. That's what the church is supposed to look like in this crazy world. See, if we'll get a hold of what came with our salvation, we'll start changing the world. Why? Because they're craving this peace that you and I are supposed to be carrying. See, the difference is in Jesus' peace in the world. The world's peace is from outside in. Jesus' peace is from inside out. What do I mean? The world are like these disciples. They'll calm down when the storm comes down. Jesus was calm all the way through the storm. And let me just say something to you folks. You know this. If you're waiting for this world to calm down, for you to calm down, you're in trouble. It ain't going to calm down. It's going to get worse and worse. I'm not trying to preach doom and gloom. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Jesus said in the last days, it's going to wax worse and worse. Paul writing to Timothy said, in the last days, perilous, dangerous, turbulent times will come. But we can be asleep on a pillow. With Jesus' peace, no outside disturbance can disturb what's going on on the inside. Now, I was tested on this this week. <laughs> Friday afternoon, Jennifer and I, well, my daughter-in-law um, had her white coat ceremony Saturday in Knoxville. She's going to be a PA. So she's got all of her classes done. So she's graduated that part. And so she's doing her clinicals for the next year. So Jennifer and I are going to go and be a part of the ceremony there, the graduation. Well, a few weeks ago, we had bought Jennifer a new car. Well, the bank did. They just said we could do it through them. Her car was older, so we went and got her a new car. And uh, so we're on our way Friday afternoon. We're going to go spend the night with Chris and Kenzie. And I'm on Interstate 40, doing about 72 in the left lane right before Kingston. Just want you to get a picture of where we're at. 72 in the left lane, which means, <laughs> you know, the way, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But... I wasn't, hey, I, I really had peace. I was good. We, we wasn't in a hurry. All of a sudden, Rudolph comes out of the woods, hits our car. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Rudolph hit my car. I'm going to have to replace the whole front end, the quarter panel. I pull over on the side of the road. I don't want to look at it. I mean, we, I don't even know if we made the first payment. 
<laughs> peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. <laughs> and Jennifer, I get stopped. Jennifer goes, you think we killed it? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I looked over and I said, I hope so. If not, I'm going to back up and kill it. <laughs> Bambi. Heck with Bambi. <laughs> you think we killed it? Goodness gracious. But here's the deal. Do you know what, though? It was like, it was like the Lord really helped me, though. Seriously. Because Jennifer and I started talking about it. I mean, we're just pulling, I called the insurance company, and it was like, see, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. It was like, hey, that deer could have come through the windshield and killed y'all. I've seen it happen to people. Killed by something like that. You know what we did? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for helping us. So we get up to Chris and Kenzie's. Of course, he's a nerd. He takes from his mother, mother's side of the family. So we walk in. He goes, you got any deer jerky? <laughs> <laughs> no, they got a jerk for a son, you little punk. <laughs> We'd be watching television. He'd go, hello, dear. <laughs> He'd go to the refrigerator and give him something to drink. He'd go, I can still kill you, punk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, so we might get through that, and, you know, we laughed about it. So we go to uh, Kenzie's graduation right there in the middle of Knoxville. And so we get there, and, you know, it's going to be a short ceremony. It's not like Tennessee Tech ceremony or, or high school. You know, those are long. It's like I'm at the graduation as long as they've been in school. You know what I'm saying? But we're, you know, there's not that many PA graduating. So I get up to the public parking. I go and I put my debit card in there. You know, and it said eight hours, uh, $8 for two hours or $10 all day. Well, we're not going to be here two hours. So I put in there, get my little stubs. I can put it in the windshield. It's two hours and 10 minutes. I'm, on, I'm 10 minutes over and I walk out and there is a ticket on my car for 30 bucks. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. You know what I'm saying? I told Kenzie later, uh, Kenzie later I hope you like your white coat. Praise God. <laughs> but you know, there again, you just got to speak to yourself. And I got, I did. I, got, I didn't even tell Jennifer this. We're riding home and I thought, well, you know, 30 bucks. If I would had to stay in Knoxville, because I had to preach last night, or, not, or service last night, I thought if I had to stay in Knoxville, you had Kenzie's parents there, both sets of grandparents, me and Jennifer, Chris, I would have probably offered to pay for lunch, and that would have been 250 bucks, so I got out of that pretty cheap. Praise God. <laughs> peace, peace, wonderful. There's always something you can be thankful for. Listen to me. Let's finish this. What I'm trying to say to you, though, is things are going to happen. Unexpected things. Jesus had a peace on the outside. I mean, Jesus had a peace on the inside that nothing on the outside could override. Jesus had a peace on the inside that nothing outside could override. Now, here's the deal. What's that got to do with us? John chapter 14, verse 27. Listen to what Jesus said. Peace I leave with you. He didn't say, I'm going to take my peace with me to heaven. When you get there, you can enjoy it. He said, no, 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 I'm going to leave something back here. It's peace. I'm going to leave you peace. I'm going to leave it with you. What kind of peace is it, Jesus? My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. It's different from the world. My peace, you can sleep through a storm on a pillow. That's the peace I'm leaving you. Is that in your life? Because you have access to it if you're a child of God. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. See, Jesus' peace is different. Jesus' peace is an internal impartation that exceeds any external situation. Colossians 3.15, we're almost done. And let, get a hold of this, guys. And let, that word let means to allow. And let, or allow, the peace of God to rule in your hearts to which you were called into one body and be thankful. Listen to that. So it's not up to God, it's up to us. We must let or allow the peace of God to rule or control 
or reign in our lives. It's up to us. So what can we do? How do we allow God to increase his peace in our lives? I'm going to end with this. Three stages of God's peace. And I'm just going to introduce them. Here they are. See, most of us have one. And we forfeit the other two. Here it is. Three stages of God's peace. Peace with God, the peace of God, and the God of peace. Peace with God, the peace of God, and the God of peace. And many believers get the first one and never tap into the other two. That's why I can't wait to get to heaven. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's the first one, and that's the one that's the most important. Peace with God. What does that mean? The Bible says before Jesus Christ died on the cross, we were in enemies of God. You and I were enemies. Why? Because of the sin. The wrath of God was toward us. But the Bible says when Jesus Christ came to earth and when he, when he went upon the cross, the Bible says that God placed his, our sin upon him and the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus so we could have access to the peace with God. So, number one, and most important, you got to get a hold of peace with God, and you get that through asking Jesus to forgive you. And the other reason this is the most important, because without it, you can't access the other two. But notice this. Notice this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He's done. Then... You will have God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So asking Jesus for forgiveness and confess him as your Lord brings peace with God. Make sure you're ready for heaven. But then after that, the peace with God gives, act, gives you access to the peace of God through what? Through your prayer. Do you understand peace is not available to people who have not been born again? They have no access to God. See, this thinking of we're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creation, but only those who accepted Jesus Christ are God's children. What's that mean? They're the only ones that have peace with God. But once you have that, now you have access to the peace of God. And the Bible says, come into my throne boldly to receive grace in your time of need. So praying brings peace of God. But notice what he says next. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. There's a third stage of peace. Here it is. Fix your thoughts. Our thoughts are messed up. Fix your thoughts on what is true. What's true? The Word of God. And honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think on these, about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. So in Philippians Four, verse 7, 6 and 7, he says, if you'll start praying, you'll access the peace of God. He said, but if you'll start thinking right, you access the God of peace. See, the peace of God is great, but the God of peace is greater. Now, here's the deal. What's the difference? Peace of God comes and goes because it hinges on our prayer life. The God of peace comes and stays. He resides on the inside, helps you sleep through a storm. Thank God for praying. But, but here's the thing. This is how it works. I can get to worrying about something, stressed over something. Maybe something's happening to my, one of my family members. And I can go and kneel down and pray, and I can sense the peace of God come. It's like the anxiety, the fear begins to dissipate, and I feel the peace of God. But what happens is I can get in my car and, and drive to work and start meeting with people and all that. And before I know it, here comes the anxiety and fear again. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Here, here it is. So, peace with God, the peace of God th- comes through praying, but the God of peace comes through pondering. Comes through pondering. See, our thinking is what determines whether we really live with the God of peace or the God of peace lives with us. Let me show you this. Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep him or her in perfect peace. Who? Who? Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Folks, praying produces the peace of God. Pondering produces the God of peace. That's why I tell you all the time, get in the word. Get in the word. Why? Because it's the only thing 
that renews our thinking. See, when you got saved, your spirit got saved, but your mind is, is not saved. It has to be renewed. And the Bible tells us the way we renew our mind is through the word of God. Listen, if you're stressed out, eight hours of Dr. Phil ain't going to fix you. Hello, or Oprah or anybody else. Thank God for people who can counsel. But listen, there's something that can renew your mind and bring a God of peace that nothing else does. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. So I want to say this to you. Do you hear what I hear? And what I hear is in times of fear and disaster, we must run to the master. Because if we will, we'll be able to access a peace that doesn't hinge on this world. I don't know about you, but that's priceless to me. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. I don't care what kind of car you drive. If you don't have peace, you ain't got nothing. Because you can't enjoy that car. You can't enjoy that money. But if you get a hold of the Prince of Peace, the Bible says it passes all understanding. I've not told any other service this. I'll end with this. I remember the first time that I really prayed this over a person. And I remember I was meeting with a lady. She was a grown lady, adult, adult woman. And her father was dying, and she was a daddy's girl. I mean a daddy's girl. Only child. I remember going to their house, and uh, I visited with him. I prayed with him. And I remember she followed me out into the kitchen before I was to walk outside, and she said, I'm not going to make it through this. And she was a believer, loved Jesus. I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm, I'm not going to make it through this. She said, I've never been on earth without my daddy being here, and I'm not going to survive this. And I said, here's what I want to do. And I thought of the scripture. He promises us a peace that passes all understanding. And I said, I'm going to pray for you that God will give you a peace that passes all understanding. It's not of this world. I'm going to pray that over you. And we prayed together. I prayed that over her because we knew that her dad was going to go home and be the Lord for very long. A few weeks went by and I was walking in the hospital over here at Coval Regional. I'm walking across the parking lot and here she comes. And she walked up to me and she was concerned. Not falling apart, concerned. And I stopped and I said, what's going on? And she said, my daddy just died. I said, okay. And she said, I, I'm beginning to doubt myself. Now think about how the devil works. I said, what do you mean you're about to doubt yourself? She said, I must not love him like I thought I did. I said, what do you mean? She said, he stopped breathing. And I knew he went to, and she said, I'm just like, okay. I'm like, okay. She had, and I said, don't you remember what we prayed for? We prayed for a peace to envelop you that passes all understanding. You're saying, I'm not falling apart and I don't understand why. Because it's a peace that passes understanding. That's why. It's a peace that passes understanding. That's what we have access to. He's good. He's getting gooder and gooder, isn't he? Praise God. Stand up with me, please. Stand up with me. Father, thank you. For just who you are. What an awesome God you are. Thank you for all these gifts that you brought when you came to earth. Now, Lord, I pray for anybody under the sound of my voice, whatever campus they're at, whether they're on the military bases, in the correctional facilities, or in another continent. Lord, I pray that you'll just speak to them right now and let them know that you're here and you're available. Now, head bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask a personal question to you. Do you have peace? You know whether you do or not. No, nope. this is not a conversation for you and anybody else. This is you and God. Do you really have peace on the inside of you? Are you just stressed seemingly all the time? Well, listen, it's available. You just got to make yourself available to it. But the first thing I need to ask you is, do you have peace with God? What's that mean? That means that you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. That you're not facing this life or 
your death without him because really it is the most important you know when I did that funeral Thursday of 10 year old Ian thank God that he had accepted Jesus Christ at a Christian camp but let me ask you where are you at with God you may not be 10 you may be 20 you may be 80 But I'm telling you right now, Jesus said, the moment your heart stops, the moment my heart stops, we're going to hear one of two things. Enter into the joy of the Lord or depart from me. I don't know you. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear enter in. And the way you know that you know you'll enter in is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you don't know whether you're right with him or not, you may have prayed a prayer sometime back, or maybe you've never prayed, but you know you want to know. If that's you, wherever you are at any campus, would you just slip your hand up? I want to lead you in a prayer. That's me. Amen. Amen. I see you. Amen. 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 Listen, I see your hand. God sees your heart. Jesus died for this moment. So wherever you're at, I want everybody to pray this with me. Let's let Jesus do business today in people's lives. Everybody pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your blood. I do confess you as my Lord and my Savior. Now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate with you. Amen. We celebrate with you. Praise God.